Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you're so welcome today. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this live webinar hosted by Queen's University alumni, Northern Irish Connections and Invest Northern Ireland. My name is Sarah Travers and I'll be guiding you through the next hour during which we have a stellar lineup of speakers for you this morning. This is really an opportunity to bring Queen's alumni together to hear leading business leaders discuss how their organizations have adapted and in many cases thrived thrive at, amidst a climate of um, well unprecedented change that we've seen in 2020. We'll find out what individuals and these organizations are doing and you can find out too what you can do to ensure that you aren't left behind. It is an opportunity also to learn what our companies featured during the webinar are doing to motivate staff during this new era, also onboarding new staff um, and find out really, you know, how you can be visible and uh, maybe an opportunity might arise for you out of what you hear today. Um, you will have a chance to put questions to our panel and my goodness, do we have a, a fantastic lineup for you. We have Brendan Mooney, CEO of the Kinos Group. We have Alison Hodgson from Virgin Media Ireland, Neve Michael Wayne from Google and Orla Doherty from Vistra Group. So you have a chance to put some questions to the panel at the end and you can do so uh, via uh, the webinar chat function there today. So without further ado, a few welcome messages now for you. Uh, let's go to our partners, Moira Loughran, Head of Northern Irish Connections, Natalie Trout, Director of Development and Alumni Relations, Queen's University, and Jenny Young, Regional Director, Ireland for Invest Northern Ireland. They'd each like to welcome you to today's event. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with you this afternoon and to welcome you to this webinar. Before we move into the main event, I just want to take a few minutes to talk to you about Northern Irish Connections. As many of you will know, NI Connections reaches out to a worldwide community of Northern Irish living abroad and friends of Northern Ireland right across the globe who share a real pride in this place and a real passion in wanting to see it prosper. So in terms of who we are, we are a team based within Invest NI's international division, and we work very closely with our colleagues across the Invest NI international network. We also work with a range of international partners and with partners locally. Um, one of whom is, of course, Queen's University, and I'm really delighted to be joining Queen's today in connecting with you, the Queen's University alumni. And for us at NI Connections, uh, the alumni living outside of Northern Ireland are really a very important part of our diaspora. And when we talk about our diaspora, I'm referring to those people who are connected to Northern Ireland, either by birth or heritage, or those who have a real close affinity for Northern Ireland, perhaps by virtue of having visited here, having been here for business purposes, or maybe having studied here. And what we're trying to achieve by tapping into the talent and influence of our diaspora is to engage with them, to engage with you in helping us and supporting us in our efforts to attract opportunities in trade, in foreign direct investment, in education, in research linkages, and in business tourism. And we are, of course, working in, in very strange times at, at the minute. And, and despite working in this virtual environment, the diaspora has really been key in our ability to attract investment into Northern Ireland. If we look back at the past number of months and reflect on some of the really significant investments that we have had, um, companies like Lift Vigilant, like Peak Six, Carrick, Insurance Office of America, 
all of those investments have all had diaspora at, at their core, really using their influence to uh, encourage those companies to locate here, to locate their operations here, and telling that really compelling story about what a great place Northern Ireland is to do business. Today's event is entitled Embracing Change and Looking Forward. And I know we have a real stellar panel of guests lined up, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from them and hearing about some of the challenges that they have faced and how that's going to inform them looking forward. But for us, NNI Connections, we really can't look forward without the involvement of our diaspora. And so I would really invite you to be a part of NI Connections. Um, to go onto our website if you haven't done so already and find out a little bit more. That's niconnections.com. Sign up to our newsletter and follow our social media channels. And for those of you who would like to get involved more actively, I would really welcome the opportunity to talk to you a little bit further um, about our future plans and also to hear some of your ideas. My contact details will be available at the end of the webinar. So for now, thank you again for listening. And I will pass you over to Natalie from Queen's. Thank you, Moira. I would have much preferred to be with you all in Dublin this afternoon. But nevertheless, I'm delighted to be here today representing Queen's University Belfast. I'm sure many of you who are listening are Queen's graduates, so a particularly warm hello to you. And if you haven't had the chance to study with us yet, it's never too late. Queen's University generates £1.9 billion of economic impact for the local economy. And throughout the pandemic, colleagues have been working tirelessly to educate our students both on and off campus. Our research has continued to tackling global challenges and seeking solutions to some of the world's most complex problems, COVID included. Our research informs our teaching, but it also informs our entrepreneurial activity. And we're delighted to have been announced as the number one ranked university for the second year in a row by the Octopus Ventures Entrepreneurial Impact Report, being noted for our highly effective approach to delivering spin out with a key focus on customer discovery. Our students have adapted admirably to the changing circumstances of the past year, but the pandemic has not affected them all equally. We are particularly grateful to donors whose philanthropy has, amongst other things, enabled us to support a digital poverty program, providing a laptop loan scheme for those who don't have access to one or helping with broadband costs. The program has also provided tablet devices for local children in primary schools, without which they might have had no access to learning opportunities at all during lockdown period. Last year, and it seems hard to believe that it was only last year, we carried out a survey amongst our alumni community, and the insights it generated have stood us in very good stead for the year that we've just experienced. In January, we launched a new e-bulletin, and in April, a weekly bulletin for those who like their news a little more frequently. We've also taken much more care to invite you, our graduates, to tell us what you think about things through our social media channels. And if you're not receiving these communications or you haven't had your most recent copy of the Graduate Magazine, then please do get in touch because we'd love to reconnect with you. The survey told us that alumni feel incredibly proud of the time they spent at Queen's and of the university. And I hope that this means many of you will want to support us as we strive to be internationally recognised and an engine of economic and social transformation within Northern Ireland. This is something we will only achieve through partnership. As a graduate, you might consider hosting a student project or recruiting one of our new generation of graduates. You might want to encourage school leavers to apply to study at Queen's or indeed anybody to study at Queen's. You might consider philanthropy, research partnerships, mentorship, or getting involved in the local network in Dublin. The list goes on. And if any of these sound like they would appeal to you, we would love to hear from you. 
I hope that once restrictions enable it, you'll make your way back to campus and allow me to buy you a coffee and hear about your life and your experiences since Queen's. But until then, I hope that you enjoy this event and I wish you and those you love safe passage through this festive season. Thank you. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen in today to our great speaker, Brendan, and our expert panelists, Neve, Alison, and Orla. As the title suggests, we want to embrace the challenging business dynamics that 2020 has brought about and look for ways to ensure Northern Ireland excels as we go forward into 2021. We want to use the learnings, tips, and tricks from our speakers and from our audience here today to ensure Northern Ireland continues to be a vibrant place to live and work. As many of you know, a major pillar of what Invest Northern Ireland does is bring in new business opportunities to Northern Ireland, and we have a major ask today on that front. The Queen's Alumni Network is a very powerful group of well-networked thought leaders that are essential to the positive evolution of Northern Ireland. So we would like you to let us know over the coming weeks or months if there are any companies, contacts or initiatives you believe could lead to new FDI or other business opportunities for Northern Ireland. We are currently living through unprecedented times of change and I truly believe that if we harness the goodwill that is amongst our networks, we can keep ahead of all the curveballs that are thrown to us in 2021. After this webinar, you will get my details and my colleagues, Terry and Nula. So please reach out to us if you can help us with this mission. Thank you. Well, thank you so much there to Moira, to Natalie, to Jenny. Um, thank you for those welcome messages. It is all about staying connected. Um, and, and we've seen that during 2020. So yeah, please do reach out. And I'm delighted now to move to our fireside chat um, with probably one of the busiest men in Northern Ireland right now. Uh, Brendan Mooney, if you're there, there you are by the uh, wonders of technology. We have got Brendan with us now. Brendan, of course, is the CEO of Kenos. I know many of you are tuning in today to hear from him. So Kenos is basically, yeah, the Belfast headquartered technology business, working with organizations around the, the globe. And my goodness, how busy 2020 has been uh, for Brendan and for all of the staff. So a little bit of background about you, Brendan, first of all. Um, after studying computer science at Ulster University, it says here, uh, Brendan joined Kenos in 1989 as a trainee software engineer before moving into a number of technical and commercial roles. And he was appointed CEO of Kenos way back in 2001 and what a journey it has been. In addition to this role, Brendan has been a non-executive director at a number of technology companies and has previously been appointed to the board of the probation service in Northern Ireland and has also served in the Northern Ireland Court Service as a lay magistrate. Um, so Brendan, it has been an incredible year for you, a really strong year business-wise, which I'm sure is kind of difficult because really one of your biggest customers is the NHS. You've also got her HM Passport Office, but tell us a little bit about what Kenos actually does and who your key customers are. Uh, Sarah, good afternoon, and thank you very much for, for uh, having me. Um, in terms of, of Kenos, the company, I mean, today we are exactly 1,900 people across 15 different countries, mainly in the UK and in Ireland. Um, today we're a, a public company, and as you've said, we've had a very busy period uh, during COVID, so our, our revenues are up about 23% uh, this year versus, versus last year, so, so clearly, very busy, and if you think about the scale of our business, just on the financial side, the uh, the forecasts are uh, there for our business is it will be about a, a 230 million euro business this year. So lots of things going on. So lots of things going on. We're probably famous for for doing two things. So about two thirds of our business is what we refer to as digital transformation, which is helping organisations connect digitally with their their patients, with their citizens, with their their customers. So you've mentioned. The passport service in the UK, so that's a service we've built in conjunction with government 
It also includes the MOT or the equivalent of a national care test. If you petition for divorce uh, online in, in the UK, we've built that service as well. And we are helping around some of the EU exit programmes as well. So that's about, about two thirds of, of what we do. And we, um, we also work with a, a big US <coughs> software company called Workday. So Workday is you know, financials and uh, HR software in the cloud, and they compete typically with uh, the likes of, of SAP and Oracle. So in terms of, of key customers, uh, we have 450 customers across our business. I, I'd probably argue that every single one of them is important because 90% of what we do is, is for our existing clients. Um, and you have 40% you know, of our business is government, about 20% is, is healthcare, which is primarily, as you say, it's our the NHS. And then in the private sector, we have clients like you know, Tom Tom in the Netherlands or Puma in Germany or in the US, people like Netflix or Match.com or, or Whole Foods. Goodness me. Take us back though to March uh, when you know the pandemic really struck. Obviously, with hindsight, digital transformation has been where it's at for every organization, for every single person. They have had to adapt and adapt digitally. But how were you when the news came in? Did you see the potential or were you like everyone else wondering what was going to happen? Well, sorry, very much in the second camp. I mean, um, so I mean, digital transformation is something we've been doing for, for 10 years. So the, the kind of the trends that we're seeing probably right now aren't, aren't news to us, but the, the question was, you know, how would our customers respond? So we're a very mobile organization. So whenever you, you join Chaos, you, you get a laptop. So our move to working from home was pretty straightforward, you know, albeit a little bit of a shock. You know, Monday, everything's in work. Monday afternoon, they're, they're being told tomorrow you're working from home. So, so that was able to be to be done from a technology perspective really easily. But the question we had back in in, in March was how would our customers respond to the challenges that COVID nineteen would bring to them? And we didn't we didn't know the answer to that question. We made some guesses and, and made some plans around those those estimates. But I have to say that um, having looked at you know, particularly in, in government, the ability for large government departments to move you know, on the 17th of March to work from home and do that successfully has been amazing, both the departments themselves, but also the individuals. We did you know, design workshops where some of our, our client staff would be on a mobile phone on a video call for three hours, helping us design software remotely. So, so I have to say really impressed with that and absolutely amazed by the quality of uh, what the NHS did around responding to that. As well, just you know, be able to do things in two or three days. It may have taken months, if not years, to achieve. Has, has been uh, been obviously amazing to, to observe that. So, I mean, for us, we certainly felt that um, there would be challenges for our customers, and if their demands for our services dropped off, then we would have challenges for for our business as well. Now, the reality has been that it's been a very busy year for us. As part of that, but but April, May, uh, even into the early parts of June, were were worrying times for us as well. Now you're talking about having 1,900 uh, uh, staff, and I know many of some of those have been recruited latterly, uh, recently. Um, how have you found keeping connected with these staff? Explain, you know, if you're if you're out there recruiting for people because you have to meet this demand, how do you integrate new people into the workforce, and you know, how do you train them, and how do you make sure that they're being looked after too? So I, I don't know that any company has actually cracked at this, Sarah. I think it's still very much, we're all learning, um, hopefully through and doing things well as opposed to making mistakes. But you know, again, if you think about our business, so pre-COVID, um, we would have had 23,000 people apply for a job at Kainos. We have interviewed about 5,000 as part of that and offered about 500 jobs, so about 2.5% of those who apply. Um, so for us, you know, in the last, Eight weeks, we've seen 145 people join the company across our various offices. Um, albeit when I say offices, it's their kitchen table and, and spare bedroom rather than, than actually physically travel to your offices. So it's all done on virtually, and technology really has helped in, in doing that. And you know, as we would do even in normal times, we check in with people uh, very early in, in their time in in Kenos. So it's you know uh, at the very start, it's every week. Um, 
uh, it's making sure that they've been able to connect with their team, that they've got all the tools they need to do their job, that if they have queries, and invariably they will have queries, we're able to deal with those quite quickly. So it's just about showing, I guess, hyper care during that early weeks. But that's something we did pre-COVID. Now we're doing it um, electronically as opposed to face-to-face. -face. How have you adapted to working from home? Where are you talking to us from right now? Nice wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you. And as you can imagine, the, the wallpaper was chosen by my wife, Irene, rather than me. I'm, I struggle to name the primary colours uh, sometimes. Uh, so yeah, I've been working from home uh, since the 11th of March. I was actually due um, that day to travel to, to New York and to do some work on the 13th of March, but decided not to travel, which was in high sight, clearly a, a good decision. Um, and I've been to the office for two hours since then as, as well. So in terms of uh, kind of working from home. There's probably been three phases for me. So I think the at the very start it was just kind of working all the time. So that was pretty much felt every waking hour, felt every day of, of every week was about we're getting our people home safely, um, getting them into work from home effectively, supporting our customers, and then thinking about our business. That was kind of pretty pretty hectic. I think over the summer then um, a better balance. So myself and the wife Irene would have gone out for. Uh, 10k walk most days, um, weather permitting, which uh, actually turned out to be quite good weather um, over the course of the summer. And in the, in the, probably the last few weeks, it's, it's probably been quite mundane. So it's um, you know shorter days. It's starting work at nine o'clock and then you know finishing up hopefully you know, before before tea time. I, I think that you know if I reflect on, on my time working from home, I would say that um, I've been pretty good at managing my my professional day. So I spend for some of my time on, on Zoom calls, the rest I spend getting things done. Um, but I probably haven't been as good at, at managing stuff outside of work. So my family, my friends, you know, my fitness, so those are, are things that perhaps I haven't been as diligent about as well. And the thing that I find quite strange about working from home for, for nine months now is that it's just been really intense. You know, there's that kind of blending of professional and personal lives. Um, you know, there's no kind of downtime. You have to go to every meeting and every task and bring your A game every time. Whereas beforehand, you could perhaps do a little bit of a quiet hour here and there. It feels like now it's just very intense. Um, you had been due to move into a massive new headquarters. Um, for anybody who knows the old uh, movie house cinema on the Dublin Road in Belfast, you know, that's where you were supposed to be heading. Um, how are you feeling about that move now? Where is where is 2021 going to see Kenos? Are you still going to be at home? Are you looking at getting back into the office? What is your goal? So, um, there's a whole bunch of questions there, Sarah. So I think that um, in terms of the movie house, um, so our plans around that are, are kind of on hold at the moment. So we still are completing the, the, uh, the planning process. We expect to demolish the building uh, next year as well. But as to when we start the construction project, um, I don't really know the answer to that question. I think that you know, one of the things that we've been really keen to do during the, the uh, pandemic has been talk to our, our people a lot and ask their opinions about working from home. So even though people have, have said it's very intense, um, their kind of long-term preference is to spend perhaps you know, two or three days a week working from home and then the rest of the time in an office environment you know, to spend time with their, their work friends as, as well. So I think that if that's the the reality going forward, then our office space requirement has just dropped by 60%. Um, and then we can probably exist in our current offices quite comfortably for, for uh, another two or three years, which is truthfully the amount of time we'll take to build uh, a brand new office. Anyway, so uh, starting in, in January, we'll be refitting our current offices. So kind of taking down all the, uh, the floors and ceilings and walls and reconfiguring them for a, a slightly different work experience for our people to return to. I would expect us to return to the offices perhaps June of, of next year. And I'm, I'm really just making a guess at this stage as to what might happen. And in terms of, of longer term um, and the, the project around the movie house, um, we were growing our business. We expect to grow in Belfast. So at some point in time, we are going to need you know, state of the art new office space. And, and the movie house is a great place for us to, to build that new office space. Absolutely. I mean, there's been nothing certain this year at all. And I think what it's taught everybody as we um, move towards December is just how resilient and agile we've all been. Um, but how do you, as a leader, sort of steering the ship through a crisis, 
it's trying to keep it together for everyone. Um, how do you manage to sustain the culture and values of chaos remotely and staying connected to your staff? Yeah, I mean, um, I think whenever you think about building uh, the company, Sarah, and, and building the people inside the company, and this is not a, a COVID comment, it's something we did long before um, this year, is we're looking for people to, to join us who share the values we have, the culture we have inside the organisation. So I, I mentioned how many people have applied to the company over the, the years. Um, you know, so whenever we were doing those recruitment, those 5,000 interviews, a big part of that process is for sure, it's about their skills, it's about their experience, it's about their potential as future employees, but also it's about their values and how they will fit into the culture. So we want to recruit people who identify with the values and culture that we have. And if they don't feel like a good fit, then we don't make a job offer as, as part of that. So, so if you recruit people who identify with those values, actually your, your, your job as leader as, as, a, as an organization is pretty straightforward. It's just keep them doing the right thing, you know, because people are, are there because they like what you've, you've told them. So if I use you know, perhaps an example, so um, go back to, to March um, time and concerns about our business, we decided to put some of our colleagues on furlough. So that was people, we have a travel team inside the company, clearly we weren't traveling. We had a recruitment team, we weren't recruiting staff. So we asked those, those colleagues to go on, on furlough. And then kind of as we went through May and into June, it became obvious that we were just really busy and we needed to get our, our colleagues back from, from furlough. So as we did that, as a company, we felt the right thing to do was to return the money to government we had got for, for furlough payments. And um, the reaction internally to the, from, our, from our colleagues was just amazing. So I thought it's the right thing to do, we'll pay it back. It's not that big a deal. But actually the, the response internally was, was amazing. And that's a, to me a really good example of where you've hired people who align with, with your goals and, and values as a company. So to me, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's just keeping doing the right thing uh, as a business and, and people will, will continue to identify with you as an organization. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that because I was going to come to that next. Um, it is nowadays that people choose the company that they align their values to. And I think that was an incredible thing that you managed to do. And it did get a lot of recognition. And um, obviously we're talking to uh, Queen's alumni right now. We'll not mention Ulster again. But <laughs> um, tell us about Kenos and the relationship that you have with Queen's and I'm sure many of the universities, but if we if we can if we stick with Queen's right now. Well I think that um in terms of of Queen's so you, you will know that, that uh, Queen's uh, set up Cubis back in 1985 and, and Cubis is their incubation arm and the job of, of Cubis was to, to develop other businesses in Northern Ireland that would, would offer employment to, to graduates. So so Cubis um Sort of in 1985, which also coincided with uh, a decision by Queen's University to change their, their mainframe computer. And lots of, of technology vendors were interested in becoming the supplier for that, that service. And so they, all these conversations kind of coalesced into Queen's and ICL or, or Fujitsu, as they're known today, creating a, a joint venture uh, called, called Kainos. Um, and we, we owe our name to the then Vice Chancellor of, of Queen's, who was an ancient Greek scholar. So Kainos in ancient Greek is means fresh or innovative. So that's um, the origins of, of the name. Uh, and the, the plan, I think, was a pretty straightforward plan, which I think always good plans always are, it was, was to take these great graduates coming from Queen's to look at the customers that Fujitsu had, and then we would build great software for them. I, I think that the plan really came together with um, the hiring of, of the kind of founding CEO, a guy called uh, Frank Graham. So you know, Frank was and, and is a kind of great business person, a great business leader, and he created this wonderful company, Kainos, back in 1986. I joined them as a trainee software engineer back in, in 1989. So uh, our relationship with, with Queen's is probably now primarily as a, as a shareholder. So they invested £25,000 back in 1986. Um, and I, I've always been struck in my time as chief exec that they've always been very supportive of what we're trying to do as a business always taking a long-term view, which has not always been my experience of, of other shareholder types. Um, and they're thinking about well, what can we do in the next five or 10 years to make a difference. So it's great to have had that uh, support. And I love the fact that they've been really rewarded for, for that support as well. So if you look at kind of the shareholding they have in Canos today and, and the various kind of share sales they've had, you know, their reward for that, that patience has been about 250 million pounds of, 
of kind of gain. So it's great to see that reward for, for that kind of long-term dialing support. Absolutely. And then how had Invest NI worked with Kenos on its journey? Well, I'm very much like, like Queen's Invest Northern Ireland have been very supportive. Um, I don't really know the detail of those very first years. I was just a, a, a software engineer. Um, but yes, you know, that, that support at the start was important to get us off and running. And that has kind of been the, the experience uh, through that as through the last number of years as well. So, so you know, the, the support they offer Kainos as an organization tends to be grouped in, in three areas. There's the, the employment support, so helping uh, pay for those initial uh, employees. It'll be around skills development, so enhancing the skills of our staff, and then supporting kind of the higher risk research and development that we undertake as as well. So a, a couple of, of, of examples. So I'm thinking maybe last year, maybe 2018, um, we invested heavily in building a, a software product. Um, so we announced a, an eight million pound investment and invest in Northern Ireland support for two and a half million pounds of, of, of that as well. So that, that kind of great support reduces the uh, risk for us. And while that's a, a very big example, Generally, they will support much smaller projects for us over a long period of time. So it's great to have that kind of partner relationship that we have with Invest Northern Ireland. We really appreciate you taking the time, Brendan, to, to talk to us today and take part in this webinar. And I know, um, well, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and I know that the attendees will be loving everything that you're saying. As I said before, we're nearing the end of the year and what a year it's been. Uh, we're looking forward into 2021. What's the biggest lesson do you think you've learned this year? Well, the biggest lesson? Um, I think that what has impressed me most uh, about the kind of story in the past nine months has just been the people inside the company. I think that as a, a group of people, they have been you know, absolutely amazing. You know, to, to move from working in an office on one day and working from home the next day to to be able to support you know all those customers globally so effectively and, and so well and to really manage the challenge around kind of blending that professional life and, and personal life um as well you know that's just been amazing to watch that kind of firsthand so you know uh, certainly 2020 is, is almost over i'm sure many of us will be glad to see the back of of 2020 but i think that we're all looking forward to a break over that Christmas period and be able to recharge the batteries and get ready for, for what 2021 holds for us. Here, here, absolutely. And I do have a lovely uh, Christmas with Eileen and your children, Kieran, Katie and Oren. Brendan Mooney, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to send you off into the virtual world now. So if you want to deselect your microphone and camera, but once again, thank you so much. That's good. Thanks, Sarah. So, Brendan Mooney, uh, a, a lovely reflection back on the year, on the successes, on the challenges um, and on the values, which I think uh, people are really aligning themselves to more and more. Uh, we're going to continue uh, now with our panel discussion. And I'm delighted now to welcome, and they should appear as if by magic, Alison Hodgson from Virgin Media Ireland. Hello, Alison. Uh, Neve McElwain from Google and Orla Doherty from Vistra Group. Look at that, hopefully Orla. Yes, there she is, Hi, lovely to see you. Um, and what a fabulous panel we have. Remember, if you'd like to put some questions now to our panel, you can send in those questions via the chat function. But um, as always, these webinars fly by. Um, really interesting hearing from Brendan there. But before I uh, move on to the questions that I have here for our three panelists, let me get them to introduce themselves to you. So, Alison, if I could start off with who you actually are and what you do. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Alison Hodson. I am originally from County Tyrone in Northern Ireland. I uh, get great assurance uh, and confidence from being from Northern Ireland. I also was very fortunate to have gone to Queen's. Um, where I did a BA Honours in Psychology and a Master's of Science in Occupational Psychology. Um, from there, I went on to become a HR Director and really have been a HR Director by trade probably all of my career in various sectors like retail, hospitality, banking. Um, and I am now currently a VP of People in Virgin Media here in Ireland, um, which is the leading connected entertainment, cable and broadcast business. Um, we're owned by an American firm called Liberty Global, who are headquartered out of Denver, uh, and they're a global 
globally um, leading converged uh, video broadband and communication business. That's me. Well done. Thank you, Alison. Great. And Neve, over to you, if you could let everybody know who you are and what you do at Google. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. And thanks so much for tuning in on a Friday afternoon coming close to Christmas. My name is Neve McElwain, originally an Ulster girl as well, although I grew up out of uh, Europe for most of my life. So I work in Google and Google has about 130,000 full time employees globally. And you can double that if you include our tents and our contractors. And our Dublin office has 4,000 full-time employees and is mainly focused on sales. And it supports the Europe, Middle East and Africa markets. So it's the European headquarters. I've worked at Google for 15 years based in Poland, Ireland and the famous Silicon Valley for eight years. Um, and my role is I design and facilitate development programs for managers and leaders. I'm an executive coach, I'm a career coach, and I also coach new parents who return to work. Wonderful, my goodness, thank you so much, Neve. Yeah, great great work being done there at Google. Um, Orla, how are you today? Do you wanna let us know uh, what you do at Vistra Group? Hi, hi, Sarah, hi, everyone. Um, delighted to be here today. I am a graduate of Queen's. Uh, I did uh, an LLB Ons law degree um, in Queen's, graduated back in 91. Um, after that, I went straight to London and worked in investment banking for uh, nearly five years. Uh, came back to Dublin, again into investment banking, number of other roles, including the stock exchange. Um, and now I work for a company called Vistra. Uh, and we see ourselves as uh, one of the top three uh, corporate service providers uh, in the world. Uh, we have 4,600 employees. We uh, go to market across five sectors, including corporate, private wealth, uh, private equity, real estate, um, and we, uh, we're, we're growing. We're very much in growth mode at the moment. Um, I travel an awful lot as, as a, uh, normally with work. So this has been a, this has been an unusual year. Uh, and my role is head of business development for the UK and Ireland. And I know that you're just back in the office for the first time today since first March. First time since March. And it's wonderful. Three or four of us in here today. So uh, it's great to be back. Right. OK, fantastic. So they are the panellists. So I've got some questions that I'd like to put to you um, today. Obviously, the focus is very much, yes, uh, targeted Queen's alumni. They are our audience today. Um, but we're looking at the importance of agility, of resilience. And um, we're looking to hear how your company is motivating your staff and tips, I suppose, for our attendees today on how to enhance visibility in your organisation and networks, considering that we're all working mostly remotely now. Um, so Alison, if I could come back to you today, first of all, with the first question on how important are building connections that matter for your role? So I smile, Sarah, when you ask me that because building connections that really matter is actually Virgin Media Ireland's purpose. Um, oh. so that, that, that is what we are all about uh, and our vision uh, is around keeping Ireland connected and informed. So when you're in HR, my job is actually all about talking to people, um, distilling the strategy to everybody so that they understand what part they then play in that strategy. And then hearing from them and understanding how, how, how we can make sure that what we're doing is right on the ground, is practical on the ground and will, and will make a difference. So, you know, for me, it, it's about continuing to make sure that we focus on all of the ingredients of being a high performance organization so supporting people in their learning and development supporting people in their well-being this year um as for everybody i really resonated with with what brendan said earlier um you know we experienced the same in virgin virtualizing our business overnight um, with relatively little issue actually and it's interesting because we've been talking for about five years about virtualizing part of our business and funny we were able to do it in five days um, so uh, it's you know it, there have been a lot of good things uh, from this year and I think we're really focused on bottling the good and taking that forward um, but for me building connections is absolutely everything. Thank you, Alison. Um, Neve, Alison was talking there about the importance of communication. Um, what, what are things like morale-wise in Google? I know you're very much involved in developing people and looking after people. And um, what initiatives are you working on there to motivate staff? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I would say, you know, like all of us, morale varies. Everybody's been on their own unique journey, whether that's been, you know, as parents struggling, homeschooling, people who've been isolated, working from home and are working with mental health challenges, all sorts of unique journeys. But I would say overall, people are feeling tired, but hopeful. They have really learned a lot. I mean, just living during this time, we are absorbing lessons of resilience, agility. As you said, Alison, who knew we could do what we've, we've just done? Um, and creativity and innovation really does emerge from crisis. So I would say in the work that I do, um, I focus on managers and we have 20,000 managers at Google. And there's been a huge uh, focus on resilience this year and helping managers build their own resilience so that they in turn can support others and build resilience in them as well. So role model it. So we truly believe that you know managers shape our culture. They are they have like a megaphone. So anything they say is amplified across uh, anyone they 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 interact with. And I often joke with our managers, you know, people talk about you at the dinner table. Did you realize that? So even back before COVID, you know, managers and leaders and how they show up or don't show up, what they say or don't say, um, that was making their way into their lives. So now, and Brendan mentioned this before, now more than ever, um, because those boundaries are blurred, managers really do impact people's lives. So we're asking Google managers to do three things. The first is put their own oxygen masks on first. And the idea here is equip yourself with tools, learn about resilience, learn what you need to do to manage your own mental health because leaders are carrying so much more than ever. Management has never been an easy job, but it's really uh, been amplified even more this year. Um, another part of this is asking managers to con connect with their peers. So I think something in management and leadership is often, it's quite a lonely job, it can be. It can be quite isolating because you're taking care of your team. So we have uh, manager communities where we get managers to connect with one another and share stories and tips and what's working and what's not. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing we're asking all managers to do is ask your team about their well-being and really listen. And managers are key in building what we call psychological safety. It's just, do you feel safe saying, I'm having a really bad day here? I really need some help. And for managers, we have lots and lots of engineers who might say, okay, that sounds great in theory, but like concretely, tell me what to do. What do I say? So we have lots of conversation guides and we have a, a framework called T, T-E-A. We invite people to take a cup of tea and it's thoughts, energy, attention it's like a framework where you can meet with your team and say what are your thoughts like are they negative or are they positive what's your energy like today and where are you going to put your attention and then the third thing we're asking um, managers to do is lead with intention so to really focus on the right priorities rather than being reactive um, really focus on setting expectations with their direct reports and their teams and then of course adjusting those as we've all had to do throughout the whole year um, and you know balancing empathy with consistency and fairness and i think um, a few things that we're doing a few initiatives that we have we have holistic programs that help people from all sorts of uh, things like mental health benefits with child care um, corp engineering helping you with your tech stuff at home i don't know about you but thank goodness my husband knows how to work computer stuff because I have had lots of challenges there. Um, in terms of learning and development, we have digital offerings. As you said, Alison, we had to just digitize everything. So we've worked on kind of like live streams like this, where we have a panel of managers and leaders talking about real life examples to let people know you're not alone. I'm going through this too. And Thank you. That, that, that's great to hear just a little bit about, you know, we heard the, we, these words are bandied about resilience and you know but you've actually given us practical uh, tools there that we can we can build on so thank you orla how has vistra adapted then to the new way of working similar or what are you doing 
Yeah, I think there's a common theme here. I think I think as as humans, we just we we just get on with it. Um, I, how is Vista adapted? I'd say beyond all our expectations. You know, to Alison's point on five years, five days, um, we have a real mix of people. So we've got we've got you know credit reg, finance, operational people commercial people dotted across the world 80 offices across 46 jurisdictions and you know in different ways different teams were used to uh, a different style of working so a lot of our ops teams were 100% office based a lot of our commercial teams were uh, are uh, used to travel so they all had to deal with something very very different and working from home whilst a lot of our teams now love it um, and they don't miss their commutes both in London or in Singapore or in even in Dublin um, you know we've learned so much from this you know we've all heard adapt or die you know um, and, and and we actually uh, started a campaign a number of very very early in, in in March April time and it was act recover thrive and it was watching our clients same as ourselves go through all of this um you know we're still in the recovery phase and and none of us really know when when we're going to come out of that but there are businesses who through this whole pandemic um will thrive after this there will there will be businesses that will crash and burn but all of them are adapting and, and they're adapting I think very very quickly you know Alison talked as well about um staying informed and connected um, we did that quite consciously, um, connected via webinars like this, connected to our teams. Monthly meetings became half hour weekly meetings. Um, you know, one to ones were just happening so much more naturally than they would. You know, I, I, I would wait to London pre pre pandemic to, to talk to people or to meet people and I'd set up a meeting when I was over there. We, did, we don't do that anymore. And the, the access that we have and the access that we've given um, our clients to us um, has been beyond all. Um, I think people are working harder than ever and I'm not sure that's that's a great thing um you know on the downside work and family life uh, have just completely merged into one um some weeks i think i see less of my children than i did when i was traveling maybe two or three days a week which is beyond belief um but i suppose i have to say our, our it part department were unbelievable you know i came back from london uh, on the Thursday that Ireland locked down and the UK was probably a couple of weeks behind us. Um, the Friday we did a kind of trial run for the Dublin office and uh, the teams worked from home and they never came back into the office. So how quickly did we do it? It was, it was, it, the IT department were incredible to get so many people um, working from home so quickly. Yeah, I think that's yeah. it. It's, it's, you know, the five days we can, we have these great ideas to digitize, to go virtual and, and look, we're doing it and I, for one, will not be doing meetings, driving, two hours to have face-to-face -face yeah. meetings and yeah okay lots in there and um, in terms of creating new opportunities in the organization Alison because I think it's been a little bit of like a let's just get through this year I mean it's great to hear there's been so much strategy and evolution and flexibility as we've gone through um 2020 but in terms of creating new opportunities across your organization um or the ability to provide employees with you know, you can try other things. How um, agile an environment would you say you have in Virgin? Yeah, look, uh, as I said earlier, we're part of a, a larger organisation called Liberty Global. So I'm very fortunate to sit on the global steer co for the future of work. So we're doing a lot in that space at the moment, trying to understand what is the purpose of our offices now? We all have lovely offices. We heard Brendan's story about Kanos earlier. Uh, and we're trying to work out the purpose of our office now. Is it around collaboration? Is it around connection? Is it about productivity? Is it about innovation? We're also then, you know, listening to our people. So one of the things that, that we have done is now um, introduce a lot more regular surveys. So, so the surveys kind of before the 12th of March here were, were sort of to be, deep breath, let's just uh, get in and, and do it. Uh, whereas now uh, it's actually people really look forward to being surveyed, asked what they think, what they want, how they see it working. And of course, like everybody listening to everybody's story today, we're landing on a hybrid blended model. But it's not going to be, if, if I understood Brendan correctly earlier, he talked about two, three days a week, two, two, three days at home. We're going to look at it more around um 60 percent of your time in the office but that might be a week at a go five consecutive days and then we don't see you for another month 
or um, so annualised out over uh, basically around thinking about, as Orla mentioned, the commute in Dublin can sometimes be be tricky. Um, and so we're, we're trying to accommodate in that way. But the one thing, and it's the dreaded thing that nobody ever wants to face into, but it is around personal taxation as well. And people have to be in the jurisdiction of Ireland. And that is disappointing for people because we all thought, wow, genie's out of the bottle, Pandora's box is open now, anybody can work from anywhere. That's not the reality, I'm afraid. The, the taxation regime has not kept pace with the rate of innovation. So you do have to be in the, or pay your tax in the jurisdiction where the value of the work is created. And it's uh -huh. the word created is, is the key thing. So you do have to bear that in mind. And rather than let that constrain you, just, just work with it. But look, you know, that they're, they're just some of the things that we're doing. But we know that what we've been doing has worked really well through our surveys. People have told us actually our pride score has gone up to 85 or 94, actually. Our engagement score has gone up to 85. So there's a real sentiment of gratitude around Virgin Media Ireland. And of course, we have our own TV station here as well. So those guys, you know, the cameramen and the news anchors, Sarah, you'll know, they can't read the news from their kitchen table. Yeah. And the cameramen can't broadcast with their camera from their bedroom. So we've had to keep some of our places open and functioning. And of course, our field technicians have been going into customers' houses the whole way through. Um, so it's been really a, a, a mixed bag and making sure that we're working with, with everybody. Although when I was with the BBC, how I would have loved if I could have woken up in Port Stewart at five o'clock in the morning and read the news from there. That would be amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, uh, Neve. There are many people watching now that maybe don't know where 2021 is going to be for them, or they're they're in their organisations. They're working from home. Some maybe you know don't have that much space or a good working environment at home, um, but they want to keep connected uh, and they want to become more visible. Uh, what what advice would you give uh, to the delegates? How can they become more visible in their in their organisations in this virtual world? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I'd say three things here. I'd say, number one, first of all, what's your why? Why do you want that visibility? We're living in the school of life at the moment, so if it's career growth and progression, we are all learning at the moment, no doubt about it. I like to reframe visibility as sharing and socializing what I have done. So if I've created a product, I want to share and socialize that out beyond my normal circle so that people can not reinvent the wheel, not duplicate work, learn from a mistake I've made, stuff like that. So that's one of the first things, what's your why? The second thing I'd say is focus on the how you do things, not just the what. And what I mean by that is because we're in crisis, it's in a sustained crisis, this is the ultimate time in teamwork actually. So are you lifting yourself and others? Are you that person who has been able to because work allocation has been turned on its head, people have been put in different roles. And are you demonstrating your flexibility, your agility, your willingness to chip in, roll up your sleeves and do what needs to be done for the greater good? Um, or are you kind of complaining and are you holding on to the old ways of doing things? So I think how you show up says, it speaks volumes about your leadership potential in terms of visibility. And then the third and the final thing I would say is living in the land of gray get used to it and what i mean by that is you know black and white answers are lovely but as we all know you know there is very little black and white in a crisis and we slow ourselves down if we keep waiting for things to be black and white or to find the perfect answer and by embracing ambiguity and showing that we are agile you know letting go of some of that certainty we actually achieve more and I think bottom line here, Sarah, and all of you have said this before, you know, connection, collaboration and community are the key things that will help everybody thrive at the moment. So if you're able to show that you are doing those things, I feel that you will be visible in doing that. Super advice again, Neve. I've been scribbling away here a little bit of coaching to get us through. Um, yeah, celebrating that grey. Wow. Well, Orla, what about um, at Vistra? Um, 
Alison talked about, you know, the changing, what, what way are we going to work in future? Maybe just yeah. you're, you're there one, one week of the year, you know, all of these new possibilities. Um, tell us about your thoughts on, on the future office for Vistra and also talk to us a little bit about the old way of doing things, that kind of trusting in your employees versus the presenteeism. I need to see them to see that they're working. Yeah, yeah. I, I think everything has has, has uh, turned on its head as, as regards that. You know, when I worked in investment banking years ago, you were in the office at half seven in the morning. If you left before half seven in the evening, it was kind of like mm, half day. Where, where, where are you off to? Um, it's not about that anymore. It's all about output. It doesn't matter what time people start work. It doesn't matter what time they finish. It's all about what, what it's all about delivery, you know. And, you know, I think the days of companies working in packed open plan offices are gone. And I don't think we'll see them back for 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 very very long time. Um, you know, a bit like Alison, we have surveyed our our global workforce. Um, you know, people like flexibility. They love variety. They don't want to be in the office all the time. They don't want to be home all the time either. Um, so I think what we're going to see in the definitely in, in in our London office and in a lot of the offices across the big cities in the world is I think the office is going to become almost a social hub where the real work's done at home, the admin's done at home. You know, a lot of people already bookend their week Monday Friday kind of admin days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, travel, etc. Um, I think what's going to change is that people are going to come into the office for things like client meetings, uh, to meet people, you know, those, you know, I don't like the phrase, but those water cooler conversations, they're just not happening right now. Some of them are happening virtually, but there's nothing beats, um, certainly from a commercial perspective in our business, there's nothing beats face to face, whether it be with your own internal teams or with clients. So, you know, I, I think, um, I think to accommodate all the new things that we've learned over the last sort of nine, 10 months um i think we, we we find ourselves where home is where the hard graft really happens but we still miss that interaction um the other piece i suppose is around you know that nine to five or you know seven till seven whatever managers i think and and, and eve you know interested in your thoughts on this managers are, are are trusting their teams now more than ever so those managers that didn't believe that someone could do a job to the best of their ability unless they were sitting in front of them uh, that's all changed and and we've had to trust one another more and actually I think we've become tighter and and much more efficient and much more the, the team dynamic if anything you know if the positive that's, that's come out of this is um we're, we're much tighter teams than than we've ever been because we've had to be and the you know especially and it, there is a weariness now but in the early days it was big virtual hugs people were people were asking people how are you feeling how's, how's your day going today you know uh, in those hot months in the summer you know even i remember us many of us in the evenings half six seven o'clock glass of glass of rosé in the garden five or six people on the screen you know we won't forget those days but i suppose i just look forward to us hopefully you know this time next year or, or certainly at a future point looking back on this and saying gosh we, we we lived through that do you remember that you know yeah i'll bring Neve in on that question because we're we're coming to the end now but reflections really on what we've learned what we've learned about ourselves and you know the way we manage our people going forward Neve. yeah i mean look i think resilience is a life skill and this is not going to be the first crisis that any of us will overcome whether it's personally um just even speaking this week my daughter um has been diagnosed with autism so it's like okay here we go that's another use case for uh, resilience. Um, I can recommend a brilliant book by Susan Kahn for anyone who wants to check it out. It's so practical and tactical. And yeah, I mean, here we are. This is the school of life. We're living it right now. Yeah, well, I've written that down as well. Um, Alison, what about you? Reflections on, on where we've been, reflections. Um, what have you learned about yourself and what will you be hoping for in 2021? Look, I think, you know, we are, we're human beings and we have five senses. And when lockdown came, three of those senses were taken away from us and we had to adapt. We had to pivot. Um, one, of, one of the great things to have come out of it is we are much more outcome oriented now. Those people who were invariably always able to turn up in the coffee queue beside the chief executive and be able to do a bit of schmoozing, that all got taken away now. So it's, it's very interesting because something is either done it's happened, it's been delivered, or it hasn't. And people aren't able to smooth the way anymore. And I think that's been that's been one of the great things. But you know, for me, the biggest winner out of all of this has got to be love. You know, I know it's a bit 1960s like, but you know, love is all you need sometimes. You do have to be kind, you do have to be understanding, you do have to turn your empathy into compassion. Yeah. 
because that will come back to you tenfold. Yeah, absolutely. What a great, what a great way to, to finish our, our panel today. My favorite thing is to move forward with courage but humility. So it is about looking after others as well. And it's been a great leveler on that front. Um, my thanks to the three of you today. Thanks so much to everyone. We are, my goodness, one minute left. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us uh, for our webinar today. We hope that you find the session engaging, that you've learned from all of these brilliant leaders here. Um, how to enhance your visibility for the right reasons, find your why in your organization and your networks, and that you're feeling energized about what's ahead in 2021. My goodness, it couldn't get any worse, could it? Um, so I think that we've learned that there've been some great positives to take with us in terms of our own agility and our own resilience. A huge thank you again to our fireside keynote speaker, Brendan Mooney, uh, to our panelists, Alison Hodgson, Orla Doherty, and Neve McElwain for their contribution to this fabulous event. We'd also like to thank once again our partners, Queen's University Alumni, Northern Irish Connections and Invest Northern Ireland. And if you would like to contact these organisations directly, you can now see contact details in the slides attached. Um, all for me to do now is to say thank you for joining us and I wish each and every one of you a very happy and peaceful Christmas and do get a rest. I think that's what we need more than anything. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.